Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, friends and colleagues from across the world. Welcome to today's Podinar session with a special guest, Dr. Harman Gomez, DDS, MD, PhD. Welcome to the show today. Thank you so much. It's a great honor. And hello from Spain. Yes, welcome Spain. Uh, we love to be able to uh, collaborate with all of our colleagues from across the world. A uh, couple of housekeeping appointments before we get uh, to Dr. Gomez's uh, presentation. Uh, it's that time of the year, friends. Uh, we are beginning the nomination process for the 2021 World's Top 100 Doctors. These are doctors who enable and empower other doctors uh, in uh, medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, optometry. You're welcome to nominate any of our colleagues. Um, second, we have recently launched a doctor's comedy uh, show. We invite you guys to, to come and join us so we can smile, uh, share a smile together. You can find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram at uh, Doctor's Comedy. And another new good news is the second book now is in the, in the works after The Power of DR was just recently published, which talks about doctor to doctor systems. Well, with that said, I would like to introduce our wonderful speaker of the day. I re we are really thankful for him coming on and bringing some of his wisdom of many, many years of, uh, uh, of education, training, aesthetics, practice management, and more. Dr. Gomez is a uh, Spaniard and graduated from University of Tübingen, Germany, in both dentistry and four years later in medicine, where he obtained his MD. He has received three national awards and contests young scientists in Germany. So he studied in Germany and returned back to Spain. He has received, uh, uh, completed also a PhD in implantology at the same university. For the past 25 years, Dr. Gomez has been in tight contact with the dental industry, such as Sirona, Espit, Discus Dental, Philips, White Smile, Cable Kerr, and other companies. He worked in the headquarters of Ivo Klar Vivident in Liechtenstein for three years, being responsible for scientific communication in Latin America. In the last 20 years, Dr. Gomez has held over 400 lectures, seminars, and hands-on workshops in 42 different countries all over the world. In addition, he's also the author of several publications in different languages. He's also multilingual. Lingual. He received his training in aesthetic dentistry in Los Angeles and San Francisco. After some years in the most prestigious dental offices of Germany, Dr. Gomez, Gomez finally moved to Spain in 2004, where he runs his dental office in Valencia focusing on aesthetic and implant dentistry. He's the former general secretary of the European Society of Aesthetic Dentistry, which is now called the European Society of Cosmetic Dentistry. Since 2013, he's the director of continuing education program, specialist in aesthetic dentistry of European Institute of Dental Education, EIDE, which is by now uh, held in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Dubai. Wow, what a career you've had, doctor. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, uh, we're highly honored to have you. You're going to be talking about uh, more efficient uh, practice management. Please tell us uh, how it started for you. How did you get interested in medicine and healthcare and dentistry? And uh, how did you end up uh, pursuing that route? Yeah, well, um, my basic interest was to be a dentist. Once I studied dentistry at the University of Tübingen, I saw that uh, maybe surgery would be a good option for me. And in order to become a maxillofacial surgeon in Germany, you have to have both studies, DDS and the MD. So after DDS, I studied medicine also in the same university and uh, I finished it. But in my final year, I found out I don't want to be uh, working in a hospital for five more or six more years before I can settle down. So I decided to leave medicine apart and, and concentrate in dentistry. So that's why, and aesthetic dentistry, because um, Ivo Klaviva Dent, where I, where I worked for three years after I finished all my studies, um, empowered me to, to go to dental materials and how to use them. And later, um, I went to United States. Uh, I worked uh, with, uh, closely with Dr. Bill Dorfman in uh, Los Angeles, and he empowered me and helped me to, to make some uh, postgrad studies at the University of uh, San Francisco, where he also studied. Wow, Dr. Bill Dorfman is very well known amongst uh, our colleagues for <laughs> aesthetic work. Uh, wow, did you do anything with the with the aesthetic societies in the U.S. the uh, 
the, the yeah, American Canadian I, 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 I a member to uh, the AACB, but I find it very difficult to travel uh, every year to the United States, so I, I stay in the European part. As you know, uh, we, we managed to do something very similar to the AACB, but in Europe, and uh, I was a big part of it at the beginning. Herman, Herman, Herman. Uh, also spelled G-E-R-M-A-N. I find it to be a cool coincidence that you studied in Germany and uh, you carry a name that's in a similar pronunciation. I understand you have a fa long family of uh, dentists and, uh, and, and uh, people with the same name. Yeah, my father is also a dentist and he has been a professor at the University of Tübingen uh, in the field of implantology. And uh, I see there are some people uh, right, uh, that they also have been at the University of Tübingen. Hello to all of you, and uh, I'm very happy that you follow this uh, podinar. Lovely. So, Doc, uh, another passion of yours is empowering doctors to uh, do better uh, against uh, businesses who don't have any fraternity to medicine or healthcare, be it people that just open up dental practices for the profit. <clears throat> or uh, I understand the laws are different from every territory. In the United States, you have to be a dentist and own the practice and operate it. I understand in Spain, anyone can uh, own a practice, which is uh, very unfortunate for the medical industry. How do you uh, mitigate that? What are your teachings? Well, um, here is uh, the, the thing. When I opened my dental office in 2004 in Spain, okay, yeah. <laughs> With Professor Weber, okay. Um, uh, in 2004, uh, I was aware all of a sudden that in uh, Spain, every every um, taxi driver can make an, a dental office. They just have to hire a dentist. In that moment, dentistry becomes pure business, pure business, nothing else. So no hypocrite. Uh, um, versus no um, ethics in dentistry, not looking what is best for the, den for the patient, only looking what is best for your pocket. And now as a dentist, if you open your dental office freshly in Spain, you compete against these people. And these people are pure businessmen. And as a dentist to compete against a professional businessmen is something different than for a dentist to compete against other dentists who all are amateurs in business, okay? So uh, for me, it was like uh, learning it the hard way. And uh, I, want, uh, I want to share my experience in these last 16 years and now in, in the field in, in Spain um, with my colleagues, with my peer colleagues, the real dentists and hygienists, okay? that uh, really look after the um, necessities and uh, what's best for the patient so that they survive. They can compete really against these big corporations, these big things that are open up, opening up with a lot of money, with a lot of marketing budget, and uh, we are small against them. So what, uh, what is our uh, weapon against these things? Our communication, our honesty, and that's what I'm talking about today. I want to talk about the communication and inside of the communication, a very small thing, the psychology. That's wonderful. You know, it's quite shameful as to what these corporations have done in the medicine and healthcare. You'll fit in right here because our concept is doctor to doctor. We believe that uh, doctors are the most powerful entity on the planet. Um, you know, we have the intellect, we have the intelligence, we have the work ethic, we have the goodwill, we have the uh, 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 reputation. Frankly, the public respects us. Uh, we have the healing hand uh, and uh, we have a lot of talents. If a fraction of doctors gather up and maximize cooperation with one another, I think they would be the ones in trouble, not us. But your nail, you hit it right on the nail. We are amateurs in business because we don't learn much in business from school. And we come out and uh, we get uh, the treatment from the corporations, uh, the full treatment. So it's very uh, uh, honorable what you're doing. I respect what, uh, for example, Dr. Stanley is doing with the slow dentistry movement. And empowering other doctors is our mission. So we are very interested to hear what you have to say. So 
What do you think uh, um, the first step should be for dentists to up their acumen in business and speaking skills and communications? Well, um, for, first of all, they should go and uh, get some continuing education. But the first step is they uh, should be really proficient and really knowledgeable in dentistry itself. You cannot sell yourself if you're not uh, confident in what you do, not confident in your techniques, not confident in the way you treat the patients. So first of all, and this is the basis of every success, is that you're really good in your clinical skills. Once you are, that does not mean that you will have success. Success is led by other factors. But the basis would be uh, get your continuing education in uh, aesthetic dentistry, in endodontics, in, in surgery, in implantology, in whatever you think um, is good for you and uh, makes your life enjoyable, okay, your professional life. And once you are really proficient in that area, then get some um, continuing education in what is communication skills, uh, sales skills, and all these things. What is your opinion of signing up for uh, master groups where uh, you gather up with 15, 20 doctors and uh, you exchange information and resources and ideas and things of that sort? Well, I've seen uh, Bill Dorfman is part of a master group. It's called Maxter Group because they are maximum masters, <laughs> something like that. Okay, So I've seen that for the last 20 years and it's a very good idea, um, uh, especially um, that you can learn out of the experiences and, um, and, and knowledge of uh, your peer um, colleagues. Well, yes, I think there's more and more of these coming up and popping up. So you're going to be talking about how we can outcompete the corporations. In my opinion, uh, um, my humble opinion, uh, corporations are big structures that need a lot of... Um, uh, ladders to climb before a decision can be made. Um, but we have maneuver maneuverability. We can quickly do things in the community. We can quickly change our programs. Um, we have that uh, uh, over them where we can get involved and uh, they can't that readily. What are your, what are some of the other recommendations you may have where we can uh, quickly outcompete these, uh, these, um, you know, essentially there are parasites in our communities. Well, um, so social media. Social media is a, a number one thing that you can do with low cost, okay, but uh, big impact. So you can um, show people that you care by doing small videos about uh, all the, the things that you do and um, how you explain things to, them, to, to your normal patient. This is how you explain it to the camera and then you put it online put it online in all your channels, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you can, um, uh, also YouTube channel. And then once it is online, you repeat that over and over again. You, you just um, um, make very, a lot of very small videos and put them online and uh, they talk for you and they talk about you at the end. That's a great idea. In fact, uh, I have personally and our Dream Team members have seen tremendous success utilizing and leveraging social media and our peers. It's a great idea. Yeah. But it takes time. You have to be persistent. You have to keep doing it. Yes, yes for sure. So it doesn't come from uh, now uh, in two days. It's a very slow thing, but uh, it, consistency um, is very important and don't don't break down if nobody sees your videos. <laughs> that happens at the beginning. Nobody sees your videos. And then later, more and more people uh, just get access to it. You spread it more and more. It's shared more and more. And then all of a sudden, you have some uh, community seeing your videos and uh, sharing your videos. That's right. And then it takes off from there. It took several years for me to actually gain uh, uh, gain some traction. So it's all about persistence, just like anything else in life, you know? Yeah. So Doc, uh, tell us a little bit uh, about your presentation. What can we expect in the next uh, uh, 45, 30 minutes? 
Well, you can expect uh, to get to know the principles of um, Professor Cialdini. He's a psychologist, okay, and he has written two books. And I will just resume these two books for you and uh, give you some examples in dentistry. One of these books it talks about pre-suation, not persuasion, pre-suation. That means everything you have to do before you really want to persuade somebody, okay? So in the, the, the setting up of everything, okay? In, in the way of psychology, of course. And then I talk about the pre-suation principles, how you can influence in uh, the, the people's mind uh, when you talk about uh, treatment options and you want them to choose one specific option, although you give them several options. Excellent. Um, you mentioned something uh, in your uh, in the documents that I read about communications inside of the office. Um, are you talking about systems of communicating between the front and the back? Are you talking about communications with the patient? What, what are we addressing here? Today, we are addressing the communication between the dentist and, and the patient. That means the presentation process of your um, proposal. Okay, you propose to make, I don't know, uh, three implants and uh, 20 veneers, something like that, okay? And you want the patient to accept that and not to go to another dentist and, and, and uh, for, you know, price fishing or something like that, shopping, but you want him to make a commitment right now to make a treatment with you and not with a big corporation that of course is cheaper than you, okay? You cannot compete in price. So um, what you have to do so that, uh, or what you can use as a psychological background to achieve that goal. It's only a small fraction of what is the communication process. Okay? I've written a whole book about the communication process between the patient and the dentist. Okay? Where can this book be found? Well, on, on Amazon. It's called? Um, communication skills training <laughs> for dentists. Skills training for dentists? Yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to put that to the side. If anyone wants to get on Amazon and uh, and uh, get a little bit more intimate with Dr. Gomez uh, in terms of his thought process and his ideas for our industry. I really appreciate uh, your presence today, Doc. We want to get to the crux of the matter. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and disappear and the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you. So I will go and pop up the presentation. Please. Okay. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, you can find also the books in uh, www.dentalbusinessbooks.com. Today, I want, I want to talk about the psychology of saying yes. So that the patient says yes to your treatment options. Okay. Um, we will talk about what is pre-suation, the different situations of pre-suation, different, the difference between persuasion and manipulation, and the Cialdini's six principles of persuasion and how to apply them to dentistry. Okay, so here are the books, uh, the three books, uh, sales skills training, dental patient communication, they are found in dentalbusinessbooks.com and uh, uh, you can find buy the books in amazon.com or if your uh, Amazon is for, for example, Germany, then Amazon.de, you go into other Amazon stores and then you find the different, let's say you are in India, well, you go to India and then you click on the, uh, on the link. Okay, good. Who is Professor Cialdini? Professor Cialdini is a Canadian psychologist and he wrote two books. One book that was written uh, in the 80s, it's called Influence, and the other book that is recently uh, presented is called uh, Presuation. Okay, so I will talk first about the presuation principles because they are really, really interesting for us as dentists when we want the patient to accept our treatment options. Um, presuation is the process of arranging for a patient to agree to your offer before he encounters it. What does that mean? So before you even 
give him your treatment options, your, you present your treatment options, before you do that, he also, he already has accepted one of them. That's not magic, that's established science in psychology, okay? So it is about what you say and do immediately before you deliver your message. Your message would be, for example, the presentation of the treatment, your treatment plan presentation, okay? So you prepare the ground first. That's about, this is all about the persuasion. You prepare the ground first. This is unperceived by the patient in 100% of, of the cases. It flies under the radar. So he is not even aware that you're already preparing the ground for him to say yes to one of your um, uh, treatment options, okay? Of course, the option that you want him to say yes to. Okay? So the choices that we make as a patient or as a person, the choices that we make are more related to what, what is in top of our mind in that moment when we do the choice. You do something that causes the patient to have a positive state of mind towards the idea or the concept of your message. Let me give you some examples before you deliver your message. So if a communicator can put us in, a mind, in mind of a particular concept, for example, fixed. For example, if I want to sell uh, implants to a patient, I want him to think about fixed solutions. If I do uh, a persuasion before I present an implant um, treatment plan, and this persuasion is going to, towards the concept of fixed solutions, he is already pre-sold on implants before he even notices it. Also, uh, if, if you uh, put into the mind of the patient like factors like metal-free or white, okay, you for sure will have to, if you present crowns, metal ceramic crowns or zirconium ceramic crowns or full uh, ceramic crowns, you guide the thoughts of the patients in, towards metal free before you present the options. Okay? And then he will, be, he will very likely choose your metal free option. Okay, or strength, high quality, or something like that. If you uh, guide the mind of the patient into, into a situation or into a, um, an area of a high quality, he definitely will choose later the more high quality solution okay, of a treatment. Then we would be channeled to thinking about that as a more important factor in our choice. So if you put in the mind of the patient, on top of the mind, a certain concept, later he will think about that first. That's all about the persuasion, okay? Example, a background picture influences the decisions. Let me, uh, let me explain to you. Robert Cialdini gives an example of a, um, of a company a factory that makes furniture. And this furniture is a widespread, like a IKEA, but it's not IKEA, okay? It's another furniture company. And this furniture company made, um, made an experiment with their clients. As soon as a client got to their homepage, 50% of these clients were directed to uh, the homepage A, and 50% to homepage B. A and B were the same homepage. The only difference was the background picture. In one of them, there were clouds, you know, get, getting the information or, or passing the information to you of, of wellness, of comfort, of being relaxed, okay? And the other 50% um, uh, were uh, directed towards the, um, the same homepage, but with a background of coins, money, 
change, something like that, okay? Now, the ones that were directed to the clouds as a, a background picture, they chose to look much, much more the options of very comfortable furniture, sofas, very comfortable ones, okay? The price was not important. The comfort was important. And the ones that uh, uh, had a, a coins or change or money as a background were all of a sudden very uh, price-oriented, okay? So you need to recognize what is the central element of your message. So, for example, um, white uh, aesthetics or fixed restorations, okay? And so what is the benefit of your treatment that would make it wise for the patients to accept the offer? And you have to, before you make the offer, make the treatment, present the treatment plan or different treatment options, you have to put his mind in exactly that um, benefit. For example, fixed. Then go to the moment before you deliver the message and draw the patient's attention to this idea. Good. By shifting a patient's attention towards a particular concept or idea, we not only shift their attention, we shift who they are in the moment. If I shift your attention towards romance, I can make you a romantic in that moment. If I shift your attention towards price, I can make you a cost-oriented buyer. If I shift your attention to quality, I can make you a quality-focused purchaser. How we do that? I will explain in a second. Okay? How? With, with our environment. Environment is one of the options we have to focus the attention of the, pen, uh, the patient. If the environment looks expensive, high-quality environment, it is much easier for us to sell a very um, broad and very big uh, um, smile makeover um, compared to if we do that in a very poor environment, okay? It channels the mind to take more expensive and high quality choices. The environment is important, okay? Doubling the possibility. It's not, I don't say that, it's science who says that, okay? So if you think you can improve your environment, do it. Your dental clinic should really look the way that you want patient to make choices. Pictures, posters, pictures on screens, okay? Veneers, implants, smile design, all these things can be spread around your office and this is the environment the patient is in and he sees all these things. He shouldn't see uh, uh, different um, posters of different uh, uh, countries. Like uh, if you were um, um, a vacation um, company, you know, you're a, a, a dentist, okay? You should offer veneers, implants, smile design, and patients love smiles and beautiful things, okay? In your appointment cards, you should so, show also smiles, okay? Then, what is focal is causal the phenomenon. This is a psychological phenomenon that we can take advantage of before we make the offer. Okay, what does it say? It says, what we are paying attention to, normally in our environment, we perceive as the cause of what is going on. Let me explain to you, okay? Um, uh, the uh, Professor Cialdini explains it in a way that uh, in an American football game, okay, some of the players were had uh, uh, ornaments that were very, very, um, you know, attention drawing, okay, so very neon or something like that, or the helmets were uh, had a different color or something like that. So all the referees were always focusing more on them. And then if a bad situation happened, the referees thought they were the cause of that bad situation because they were always focusing on them, okay? So draw the attention to a feature. For example, in a nice picture, the veneer or the implant of a patient, okay? And the, pa the patient will perceive that as the cause of the beauty. 
of the beauty of this patient, okay? Or at the happiness of the patient, okay? Happiness or beauty. Now, paint a picture in the mind already owning a certain treatment, okay? They should pre-own it. A lot of, um, you know, car companies do that. Uh, you go to a BMW um, car sales uh, um, facility, okay? And the salesman paints a picture in your mind about you owning already that car and driving Napa Valley and uh, this beautiful landscape. And, and you are thinking, of, wow, that's really nice. And all of a sudden he has uh, um, pre-sold you on that BMW, okay? They will, pre you will, as a patient, prioritize this one above an alternative all of a sudden. Example, for example, a uh, patient sits down and um, it can be true or it cannot be true, okay? You just say, before you even uh, talk about his problems or what else, okay, you might already be pre-informed of what he's looking for, okay? By your hygienist or by your dental assistant. So you know this patient um, is interested in uh, spine makeovers or something like that. Okay. So you he comes in and says, Hi, how are you? Well, I am really happy. A patient just walked out with her beautiful new smile with veneers, stunning. She was so thankful and happy. So first we we mention happiness, we think we mention um, uh, beauty. We, we mentioned veneers, okay, beautiful new smile, okay, thankful, and the patient is already pre-sold on veneers without even knowing it, okay? Now, there is also another psychological um, need in a patient or in a person itself. Um, it's the need to closure. What is that? Well, we need to close a mystery. If there is a mystery, we need to resolve it. There is a tension, inattention in everybody to resolve the mystery. So the attention raises and he wants to resolve the mystery. Now, how is that good for us as a dentist? Well, um, imagine you want to tell the patient that you are... Um, very good in implantology, okay? Instead of telling him, well, we are really good in implantology because of our experience, because of uh, we, we have made already uh, 3,000 cases, whatever. Instead of telling that to the patient, you should make a, a, a question first as a mystery. That means, why are we, as an office, for example, perceived as the top office for dental implants in town. Well, all of a sudden, the patient starts to pay attention to what you will say next, because it's a mystery for him, all of a sudden. If you would have said that, what you would say next, just like that, it would come in here and out there. But now it gets registered because you made a mystery out of it, okay? That's a psychological trick. That's pre suation With this sentence, you have pre the patient to pay attention to what you will say, okay? And to register it, okay? Now the attention is drawn to your next message. As people want the question to be solved, it's, a, it's, it's psychology. Good. Or pre-questions, okay? One question at the beginning focuses a new patient on the positive aspects. For example, of you and your office, for example, before you even start discussing anything with the patient. So, one pre-question could be, why did you choose us today? Or even better, what made us interesting for you to choose us? So now the patient starts to think about all the positive, because it, it has to be positive, otherwise he wouldn't have called you or office, okay? so. Somebody told him about your office. Uh, he saw some uh, videos on YouTube about your office. Uh, he uh, followed you on Instagram and found out uh, you have valuable uh, information, um, whatever. Okay? So um, 
something positive is there that make him call your office to make an appointment. So now you bring that to the surface, positiveness towards you. So this makes him much more open for your options. Why did you come to us today? But much better is what made us interesting for you to choose us. Now, free question for focus. Now, uh, imagine, Professor Cialdini gives this example. Imagine um, on the street, somebody um, is making a survey. So he, you, you know that. In, you know, on the street, they, they stop you and say, oh, do you have a minute uh, just to make a survey with me um, um, about, about your consuming um, activities or, or something like that? Um, people that want help for a survey usually get a no as most of the answers are no. No, no, I don't have time. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Okay. Only 29% agreed in that published um, uh, survey. Okay. About making a survey. All right. Good. 29 agreed. Now, if the people that made the survey made a pre-question, like, do you consider yourself a helpful person? Then people think, yeah, of course I'm helpful. Yes, I'm a helpful person, of course. Okay. So only with this question, they persuaded the person to be a helpful person. And all of a sudden, then they made the second question was, uh, can you help me with the survey? That I'm doing right now, then 77.3% agreed. Okay, how can we use that for our office? Okay, um, well, this is more than double, much more than double, okay, of the patient. So you raise much more than double the possibility that a patient chooses one specific um, option of your treatment plan options. Okay, how? Well, you can make a pre-question. Like, do you consider yourself a quality-oriented person? Then you shift his mind towards quality. Do you consider yourself a beauty-oriented person? You shift his mind to beautiful things. Do you consider yourself a comfort-oriented person? You shift his mind to comfort. comfort. And do you consider yourself a stability-oriented person? You shift his mind to stability in plants, okay? For example, well, these are the things that you can do. Of course, before you make the, offer your treatment options. Now, once you do the communication of your treatment options, there are also six principles of persuasion that uh, Robert Cialdini uh, described in his book, Influence, okay? Now, what are these six um, principles? Well, first, of, first is reci reciprocity, second is scarcity, third is authority, fourth is consistency, commitment, liking, and consensus, social norms, and social proof is the last one. Let me just go quickly over them, okay? Persuasion is the ability to move someone in our direction to make him more likely to see things our way or the way we want him to see the things by virtue of how we present our ideas to them. Not what we present, but how. Through communication. Now, do not mix up persuasion with manipulation. Persuasion involves education, information, genuine facts. The intention is to help. Of course, we're dentists. We want to help. We want the best for the patient, okay? But sometimes these best solutions are very expensive and the patient is not likely to choose them. Manipulation would involve dishonest presentation of ideas that doesn't help the patient. No genuinity in it is in it, okay? This is done a lot of times by people who only want business. And you know what I'm talking about right now, okay? So reciprocity, one of the principles, 
is an implied obligation. How do you take advantage of that? Well, um, if somebody does something nice for us, we feel like obliged to do something nice for them. Example, if I open a door for somebody, this person is like have a, has an inner obligation to mm, help me in the elevator or lift to keep the door open later for me. Okay, I do something for you, you do something for me. That's reciprocity. Okay, um, it's nearly universal, but it does not work with self-centered people. They just uh, keep getting things and they don't feel that need to um, uh, make something good for you. Okay, reciprocity is an exchange of perceived value. You do something nice for a person, but for you, it's not so much work. So the value is not so high. But if for this other person that receives this, um, 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 th this action of yours, if for this person it has a high value, he is more likely to make something big for you as a, uh, as a favor back, okay? Um, patience usually reciprocate with loyalty, positive reviews, and referrals. And believe me, you need all these three things, okay? If you want to be successful in a, in a hostile environment. And you can give them ebooks about their issue. You can give them white papers. You can give them, you can help them out uh, with special uh, treatment hours or something like that. You do something special for them. And you have to make them see that you do something special for them. If you do it just like that and they don't see it, uh, there will be no reciprocity. You have to make it see. Small gifts, toothpaste, floss, okay? Uh, this helps the patient to be happy. Now, second principle is scarcity. If there are only a few available of it, or it is available only for a limited time, people are more likely to want it. Oh, it's only now, or there are only a few, I want one. It, it's, it's, it's psychology, okay? So how can you make scarcity work for you? Well, the problem is there are two limiting factors. You cannot use it for a long time, otherwise it's not scarcity anymore, or and you cannot use it too often, because otherwise it wouldn't, it wouldn't be, be scar anymore. Now, time-limited offers. You can make time-limited offers. You put an added value package together, like exam, x-ray cleaning, and bleaching in one package for a limited time, okay? That's scarcity. After this time, it will not be offered for that price. That's it. By the way, I'm not a fan of making discounts. I'm a fan of keeping the price, but add some value, okay? That's why I tell, uh, that's why I say uh, put added value packages together. Package with a special price in a time, uh, and the time is limited. Time limited offers, for example, offer an intense service. In instead of only making uh, an oral exam, you do an exam and oral cancer screening, for example, but only for a limited time. Then people will say, oh, I, I make the appointment right away. For example, if you uh, want to reactivate um, overdue hygiene patients, okay, that are two years back, they came to the office, but uh, have not scheduled again a hygiene appointment, you say, well, only this month we have a limited time offer. It's the exam and the oral cancer screening uh, on top of it, but for the same price as the exam. Okay, limited time is the key in that moment. Okay, or an exam in a digital smile design. Okay, people will take advantage of that. Scarcity through reputation. If you establish yourself as an expert in your, in your city or in a certain field, sleep dentistry, for example, okay, then, and there are not many of them in your city, then that's scarcity. And there is only one of you in town. That's scarcity automatically, okay? Scarcity through schedule. Produce scarcity in appointment availability. Imagine you have available appointments, but your front desk gets the instructions by from you to tell the patient if he wants to schedule 
oh, it's this this week is really full. But let me let me see if I can squeeze you in. Okay. So here you do two things: you produce scarcity because it's full. Okay, and free appointments are scarce. And second, you produce reciprocity because she does something good for the patient. She squeezes him in, squeezes him in. But in reality, there is a free space. But uh, she doesn't say that to the patient. Okay, so we produce two psychological things at once in this moment. Scarcity by numbers. Only X patients get that offer or plan. Imagine you say, wow, I, I would be so happy if this month I could do 20 veneer cases. I would be so happy. Don't do that. Don't uh, look at it uh, this way. Look at it this way and say, this month, veneer cases are done only for 20 patients because the doctor is, uh, is very um, um, busy and uh, there is only space for 20 cases. So get your space now to do uh, your uh, veneer case. And then patients all of a sudden say, wow, um, only, only 10, only 20, whatever, okay? And uh, two of them are al al already done, gone. So eight, uh, eight patients left. So they will want it because scarcity is a psychological principle of influencing people, okay? Scarcity by day, only until X date, for example, okay? Or a combination of both. Good, authority. Become a trusted authority in being a dental problem solver, okay? Dentistry is a trust-based business. Now, you not necessarily have to be an authority, you just have to be perceived as one, claim it. And that's why social media are so important. You spread your word about yourself and you uh, establish yourself because you give tips and tricks about uh, uh, all things uh, like bruxism, like uh, how to clean uh, an implant, uh, how, uh, how uh, the implant case uh, is performed, all these things, very small videos, one minute videos, you explain uh, very small things. Imagine it's a patient sitting there in your chair and it's asking you a question. And you just answer that question. You get, get a, um, a mobile phone and you just record yourself answering that question. And you put it online. All of a sudden, you start to be an authority in your community. And also, um, you have to be likable okay, and re reliable trustworthy expert. You have to be perceived as one. Everything around you should communicate you are the trusted expert, okay? In your advertisement, in your social media, whenever a, spa a patient talks about you, he should talk about you as an expert, okay? You claim authority and then later you exercise authority, okay? But claim it, claim it. You are a professional. Yeah, but every dentist is a professional. Yeah, but you claim it and they don't. Increases case acceptance and builds patient loyalty. All these things, okay? Or if that is not enough, imagine you are a freshly graduated uh, dentist and you're not so, um, you don't have 5,000 cases, you don't uh, uh, have that expertise behind you. Okay, then you use third party authority to um, make the patient choose what you say is good. Okay, but not in this case, not because you say it as an authority, because others say it too. Like you claim that studies of prestigious universities, prestigious professors, prestigious countries say exactly that, that uh, or celebrities or other professionals state that the treatment option that you are offering him is the best choice in their situation, okay? In this case, the authority is a third party and not you, okay? Now, the next principle is consistency and commitment. Once a public commitment uh, to do something has been made, people tend to act consistently. What does that mean, okay? Um, instead of, in, in, in dentistry, and this is proven, Scientifically, in dentistry, if you give a filled out appointment card to the patient, 
there are no shows. Well, that's true because uh, things happen. But you can lower these no shows just by giving a blank appointment card and a pen. In that moment, the patient has to write down the date and the hour. In that moment, he feels like committed to what he wrote down. And in that moment, uh, the no-shows drop 18%. Only by doing that, of course, you will do um, uh, you, you will send them a WhatsApp or something like that or an SMS uh, reminding them about the, uh, the date three days before and then one day before again, okay? And this drops the no-shows even more. But only by doing this small trick and nothing else, 18% of the, uh, the, the no-shows drop 18%. Because they made a public commitment to that date and time by writing it down themselves. They felt like obligated, okay? Instead of giving, being given this appointment to them, they committed, okay? Now, liking, liking is a big factor. We buy from people we like much more often than we buy from people we don't like. Well, that's, that's a, we know that, I know. So the, 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 the problem is, how do you make a patient like you, okay? Well, likability is strongly based on how similar they are to us. Find a commonality with the patient. It can be the cultural level, the hobbies, the interests of the patient, okay? Uh, fans, are you a fan of, um, I don't know, Real Madrid or Barcelona? Kids, do they have kids in the age of your kids, okay? Uh, what high school do they uh, go to? What college do they go to? Okay, all these things, you can find a community and then talk about that the whole time. People see you as similar. And once they see you as similar, they like, they start liking you. That's a, a psychological trick, okay? And bring that to the surface. Positive connection, or you can make a positive connection also through general compliments, okay? First, uh, commonalities. Second, you compliment the patient, but genuinely. Not like a fake thing, okay? You, it, it has to be true. And it has to be something that is really worth complimenting. For example, if he, if he really has a taking care a, a good oral health, you say that to the patient. Wow, I'm so happy to see finally a really good uh, mouth or taking care of mouth or something like that. Or if he is uh, very well dressed, you compliment that. Everybody likes compliments, everybody. And praises when they deserve it, but only when they deserve it. And then the third thing, how you can make uh, you be likable is listen to them. You do 20% of the speaking, they do 80% of the speaking. You do 80% of the listening, they do 20% of the listening. That's a golden rule, okay? Listen to your patient, show honest interest. Likeability has nothing to do with the technical aspects of dentistry. You can be a very good technician, uh, um, a very good implantologist, a very good uh, um, prosthodontist, a very good orthodontist, a very good endodontist, okay? Your, endodont uh, your endos, um, your, uh, the canals are perfectly sealed, but if he doesn't like you, he will not buy from you. That's the problem, okay? He will buy from another dentist, who is not as good as you are. And he will get a lower quality. So you have to be likable, okay? Then the next is uh, consensus, social norms, and social proof. People want to follow what those around them who are similar to them are already doing. They feel comfortable doing what others also do. How can we use that for dentistry? What helps? Well, reviews, manage them, thank them. If you have online reviews, thank them. Uh, ask for re reviews so that a lot of um, social proof is there, okay? In uh, your um, social media, request reviews, state, this is our most popular choice. This is the best sentence ever, okay? So if the patient 
if, if you if you um, say okay uh, this um, gap here in your mouth we can make a, a bridge we can make um, an implant or we can make a, um, a removable um, prosthesis okay these three options of course this is a very 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 condensed resume of what uh, of your treatment option plan uh, but let us uh, think that you just said that okay then you can say well the implant that is our most popular choice among our patients all of a sudden the patient feels much better if he takes the same choice as all the others or another um, so 20 percent you get 20 percent more yes if you say this sentence or you can say this option is increasing in popularity so they also feel much better if they choose that option okay also 20 percent more good now um if you want to know more about these things the dental patient communication it's here in this book boosting treatment acceptance or there are other other books like the sales skills boot camp for dentists you find all the, these things on amazon or dentalbusinessbooks.com and uh, in dental business books, you go, if you don't uh, purchase directly from Amazon.com uh, and you have another Amazon, like Amazon.in, I-N, India, um, you can go to Amazon, other Amazon stores, and then you just choose your country and you may click there. Okay. So thank you so much for your attention. And uh, let's, let's see if there are some uh, questions now. Wow, doctor. Uh, that was, thank you so much for the presentation. I, uh, personally have to rewatch this multiple times. It was so much good information for our colleagues. Thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. So, uh, here's a question. Uh, what, uh, how do you think, uh, cultural differences, uh, impact the recommendations you have made custom norms and so forth? Yeah. Um, it, it... In, in what uh, sense do you mean the cultural di differences? For example, uh, um, if you're trying to make jokes for one culture patient, they might have a different reaction than somebody else. How do you mitigate that? Yeah, of course. Uh, jokes is a very, very important thing. And uh, also religion. Don't go into religion. Don't go into politics. Don't go into... Uh, jokes that are that are not globally accepted. Okay, it's better to make jokes about yourself. <laughs> this is always accepted. Okay? Yes, always um, <laughs> accepted. Right. Yeah, but uh, never do jokes about uh, uh, any nationality um, because, of course, uh, maybe the patient is related to that nationality. You don't know. Uh, um, you never know. So jokes, politics. And um, the third thing is religion. Uh, you don't uh, talk about uh, that never in your office. That's a uh, very smart politics as well. Cause you know, I always tell my friends that also dentists that go on social media and post on politics, no matter how genuine you are, when you start talking politics, there's another half of people that are not gonna like you, right? Exactly. No <laughs> there's <laughs> no way to win i don't know why they do it it just you create enemies and you create a lot of them yeah. and enemies that are actually your colleagues that like you for what you are for who you are what you stand for so i always recommend also to stay away from politics religion uh ethnicity uh, all of yeah. those things that are uh, that are uh, that can set somebody off of so, Doc, uh, that was, uh, I'm, I'm just still uh, so much good information in there. Preemptively, we make a lot of those mistakes uh, also chair side. These patients don't care about uh, what kind of manual dexterity they have or what knowledge we have about six degree taper. They want to they wanna be treated well. They don't want to get hurt. They want to come into a clean office. They want to be smiled at. They have a whole set of different priorities than us. So this was quite refreshing. Do you do courses, Doc, about this kind of stuff? Yeah, we have courses, even online courses. But uh, I, I, I do that with the Mastery Academy, uh, which is based in Bahrain. 
So they have online courses about these topics. And uh, we, we plan to do in Istanbul uh, a master program. Very smart. Uh, we have um, some colleagues with the Global Summits Institute out of Dubai and, uh, and the GCCs actually work with, uh, uh, with uh, some well-known doctors there. This is a very interesting topic. This could help a lot of doctors around the world uh, um, get better at what they do. And a lot of the things that you talked about apply to just pretty much all dental practices. Creating, uh, exploit, exploring uh, a scarcity, uh, making the patient feel as if you uh, are there for them versus you bragging about what you have accomplished. Nobody wants to hear that. Uh, those things go uh, quite a far way. I love the way you framed all of that. And uh, patients want to be listened at. If a patient has the... Um, that's why you have to do 20% of the talking and 80% of the listening. So uh, if a patient feels that you have listened to him and um, have captured his problem, okay, then whatever you uh, offer as an option, he feels that this option is the correct one because he feels understood, okay? So uh, how do you do that? There are also psychological tricks of repeating the last sentence they said, for example, okay? or the last words they said, that it keeps them, it, that is reassurance of that you are listening to them, okay? That you're not, that you're present. You have to be present. He wants you to be present and to listen to them. So what is important to them? What uh, makes them feel that their smile is not nice? Maybe you have an, uh, an idea of, oh, he doesn't like his gummy smile, whatever, okay? Uh, but it's not that. It's his lung canines. How could you know? Okay. He has to tell you. So don't pre-assume things. So let him talk. Let him talk. Let you, and he will first like you because you let him talk. And you're the first one who really understood him in his heart, you know. And that, that decides much more about whether or not you are going to make the treatment and not another one. Then if you have a lot of diplomas there behind you and a lot of courses made, um, if he doesn't like you, you will not do it. Wow. Uh, so uh, trust is a big factor, right? Ultimately, all of the small talk and, and all of that leads to trust and a patient rapport that you, uh, that you deploy in your practices. Now, tell me, Doc, 95% of the time this probably works, but what do you do? The other five percent of the time, when the patient starts talking and talking and talking about unrelated, <laughs> unrelated no. topics, and and and, and uh, having bitten into a salad or a piece of chicken and broken their teeth and all that, what do you do? That's good. So um, I let him talk, and then I say, "Wow, uh, I'm." It, it seems as if you had really a great time with your nephew this weekend. But let me ask you a question. Boom. Gone. Right. Okay, because uh, <laughs> yeah. that could go on for a long time and it can yeah, lead to nothing because you're not trying to help them and they're telling you about something that, uh, well, you know, another patient in the chair is waiting for you to care for them. Of course. Um, you have to interrupt them, not, not like uh, immediately, but after a while, and you see uh, the conversation is not going in the direction I want, okay? Then you, you just uh, be assured that you have heard what he said, and you are interested, interested, okay? And by saying, wow, it seems as if, blah, blah, blah. And let me ask you a question. And then you start redirecting the conversation into their mouth, their teeth, what is really important. Do you ever like put your hand on a patient's shoulder and say, hey, everything is gonna be okay? Some people well, are okay with that. Some people are against that. I don't know. Yeah, a, a cultural thing, okay? There are some cultural uh, areas where we do not touch the patient, okay? Um, but uh, some patients, uh, if I feel... I've never had a problem with putting my hand on someone's shoulder and saying, hey, it's going to be okay, you're going to get through this, it's going to be fine. And I, get, I see a lot of apprehensive patients, you know, that we also, a lot of them we put asleep, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm, in, in most of the cultural um, areas, it's okay. 
that if you put uh, the hand on, on a, um, for example, a married Arabic woman and say, uh, it's okay. <laughs> this is not going to help, okay? Yes. Uh, problem right so that that would be a problem in some of our patients because uh, um, because I do a lot of lecturing in, in, in Arab countries they, they come from there uh, to our yeah, that's a no no I'm talking now American culture European oh, culture. culture I think there's no problem and and you show empathy which is really it makes you likable yes likable funny do you ever take a minute to do something different for them? Maybe get them a pillow, maybe a blanket. I've done those kind of things and they end up writing reviews about it. This guy just stopped his procedure. He went and got me a blanket and got me water and got me this and got me that. Immediately, not only you, your whole team should be aware of whether or not the patient is comfortable and whether or not the patient is okay. And uh, for example, if we see a patient has a, a dry lips, uh, he gets Vaseline done or lip balm, and then he gets this lip balm as a present for him uh, to take home. All these things, okay, very small things that make the patient experience different. But that's a whole other chapter. Yes, I'd love to have you back on the show. In fact, you're going to get an invitation from... Um the Board of Regents, as well as the Global Summits Institute uh, organizing members. We're currently uh, writing a book uh, with uh, our second edition book uh, that is uh, titled Doctor to Doctor. Love to have you contribute a, a chapter if you're willing. You. And uh, some information will come your way. And we hope to have you back on the show. I was so happy to have you. This was a fresh breath of air of someone that really cares for the profession and, uh, and enabling and empowering other doctors with uh, little tips and tricks. You know, our lives are very stressful. We have families, we have offices, we have continuing education to worry about uh, um, and all of the other things. And at the same time, we're trying to help uh, uh, X amount of patients a day to um, have a better quality of life. So those that help us, uh, um, we are uh, grateful, uh, uh, ever grateful for it. And I really thank you for what you do for the profession and uh, all that you have done to contribute today for us. And look forward to having you back on the show. Maybe in 2021 will be a better year for everyone. For sure. <laughs> but worse than 2020, <laughs> I don't think. Not possible. <laughs> what are you going for? The Russian vaccine or the US vaccine coming up? The vaccine. It's done in Tübingen University in my <laughs> alma mater. Is it really? Really? It's true. Yes. That is lovely. Uh, so they're actually, uh, uh, um, is it out on the market? You know, uh, they are now in the first uh, um, clinical testing phase. So what, are it was six months to a year before we see uh, something? Yeah, beginning of next year. Beginning of next year. I think once the vaccine comes out, uh, things are going to start heading towards whatever the new normal is, but uh, it'll be better than this. For sure. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Gomez, and uh, we look forward to having you again. Thank you. It has been my pleasure and a big honor to share everything with you. And uh, I'm a big fan of you, Dr. Shah, and uh, what you have built. Okay. So I'm honored and, and happy to be part of it. Thanks. It's our duty to serve the profession. Thank you, Dr. Gomez, and I appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>